Everyone thinks they know the story of Henry VIII, a man whose love life changed the religion of an entire country. They know about his wives too, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. When we think of the queens who had the biggest impact on the English Reformation, we think of Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon. But I am neither of those women. That's me, Catherine Parr. I'm the one who survived, but I'm also so much more. Today, I want to tell you about the Reformation and how I helped to change the religion of England forever. By the time I became queen in 1543, the English Reformation under King Henry VIII had been going on for 16 years, since 1527. So, before I begin with my story, let me give you some context. The first thing to understand is, as far as Henry was concerned, when he broke with the Roman Catholic Church, his royal supremacy over the Church of England had nothing to do with religious reform. Instead, it was simply a rejection of the legal powers of the Pope, so that he could claim the power to divorce Catherine of Aragon. Breaking with Rome was not meant to lead to a change in religious theology at all. But it did, because this break with Rome coincided with reforms begun by Martin Luther in Europe. In fact, for Henry, the decisions that he made affecting religious policy in England seldom had anything to do with theology or belief. But just because Henry was motivated by non-religious reasons doesn't mean his advisers felt the same. Henry was notoriously susceptible to influence, and if those who held his trust were able to steer things in the direction that they favoured, then the king might back them. Let us assume that all the white figures are Catholic in their belief, and all the red are reformers. Here is King Henry, Catherine of Aragon, and the Pope. Henry's infatuation with Anne Boleyn necessitated breaking with the Catholic Church, and therefore led to Henry promoting reformers such as Thomas Cranmer in order to achieve this. When he married Jane Seymour, the reforms instigated by Anne Boleyn and Cranmer slowed down until the rise of Thomas Cromwell. Closing the monasteries rather than reforming or improving them was motivated by Henry's desperate need for money, but also Cromwell's reformist intentions. After Jane's death, Henry's political isolation from France and Spain led to him negotiating with the Protestant German kingdoms and marrying Anne of Cleves. However, throughout all of this, Henry's personal religious beliefs remained conservative and unchanged. Whoever was closest to the king was able to control the religious and political direction of the country. In 1547, the leading conservatives who hoped to promote a more traditional, Catholic, religious policy were Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, Stephen Gardiner, the Bishop of Winchester, and Sir Thomas Risley, the Lord Chancellor. On the reformist side was Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, Edward Seymour, Prince Edward's uncle, and me, Queen Catherine Parr. As Queen, one of the main ways I impacted the Reformation was by influencing the King. And the first thing I did was reconcile him with his daughters, the Lady Mary and Lady Elizabeth. After we were married, we went on progress and I arranged to have all his children stay with us at that time. The effect on Henry was profoundly positive and I pushed it to its full advantage. My Lord, have you enjoyed having your children about you these past few months? Indeed I have. Your daughters are both accomplished and remarkable women, are they not? It is true. I am proud of them both. I think they do you credit, sire. Any father would be proud of them. As their stepmother, I love them as my own. This is a blessing, as I fear I am barren, since I've had no children from my previous two marriages. If we have no children, I fear for the succession. Prince Edward is but a boy, six years old, my sole heir. And so many children die young. My lord, Although you have but one son, you have three children. Why not reinstate Lady Mary and Lady Elizabeth to the succession, just in case Edward dies without having children of his own? Then the line will be secured. Six months after my marriage to Henry, Parliament overturned the 1536 Succession Act and reinstated Mary and Elizabeth as heirs to the throne. When looking at English Reformation as a whole, 
Elizabeth I was crucial, and without my influence, she would never have become queen. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself how a king, predominantly Catholic in his beliefs, was succeeded by two reforming Protestant children? Getting Henry's daughters reinstated was only the beginning of my influence on the royal children. There was only a four year age gap between myself and Lady Mary, so I was more friend than mother to her. But Prince Edward and Lady Elizabeth were only six and ten when I became queen, and I was instrumental in both of their educations. I made sure their tutors had humanist views and therefore favoured the new learning and the new religion. My influence on Princess Elizabeth went further than choosing her tutors. She looked up to me, not only as a mother figure, but also as a role model for female scholarship, queenship and religious belief. This even continued after Henry's death when she was entrusted to my care and came to live in my house. It was Catherine's influence that mattered. Her younger stepdaughter remained with her for most of the summer and autumn and the effect was profound. Elizabeth embodied the religious life of Catherine's household. She witnessed Catherine's masterful conduct of business and the effortless ease with which she, a mere woman, imposed her authority in and on a masculine world. In short, if Catherine had a legacy, it was Elizabeth herself. Access to the king and having his trust was the route to being powerful and influential at court, and King Henry's trust in me was making the conservative faction at court very uneasy. I had been left as regent, in charge of running the entire country when Henry had gone to war in 1544. Since I had become queen, I had encouraged religious debates within the court, which Henry tolerated. He even debated with me directly. Henry also knew that in 1545 I wrote my own theology book, Prayers or Meditations. It was the first book written in English to be published by a woman under her own name, and it became an instant bestseller. This type of religious freedom was technically illegal, as women were not supposed to preach religion. But while I had the king's favour, I was untouchable. That was a problem for the conservative faction. You see, with an ageing and sickly king, and his heir still only being a child, everyone knew that a regency was becoming ever more likely. And with me being so high in the king's favour, the conservative faction began to fear for their waning influence. If the king should die, and I were made regent over the young prince, I would be free to promote those who agreed with me, and demote those who didn't. In short, the conservatives would lose their power. Therefore, the conservative faction began to look for a way to remove me from power. They got their chance on New Year's Day, 1546. A New Year's gift for you, Your Majesty. Hmm. What is it, my dear? It is a translation of the Queen's book, Prayers or Meditations, Your Majesty. From the original English into Latin, French and Italian. I did it myself. Sir, you seem angry. Were you aware that Elizabeth had committed herself to this, in spite of my belief and teachings on matters of true religion? Sire, if I may say so, I see no reason why a difference of opinion should cause such upset between us. No, madam. You may not say so. Your religious meddling has gone too far. Women ought to be instructed in matters of religion, not take upon themselves the role of instructor. Historians believe that it is unlikely that Henry read my book in the original English since vernacular religion was considered women's work and more serious, complicated theological debates were masculine and conducted in Latin. The translation of my book into that language seemed to impress on Henry how far I strayed into this forbidden territory. Henry's irritation was what the Conservatives were waiting for. They began whispering in his ear and exploited his impatience with his new wife. Come. Um. Good day, Lord Chancellor. Good day, Your Grace. Why have you come to see me today? My Lord, the Queen is becoming too powerful. She no longer listens to you on matters of religion. Division between the King and the Queen undermines your position as head of the Church of England. She's a Protestant, a heretic. She deserves to be burnt at the stake. Very well. Whilst they whispered poison in the king's ear, I knew nothing until the king's doctor warned me that the Lord Chancellor had been given a warrant for my arrest, signed by the king. 
but I knew if I could only get to Henry, I could get him to change his mind. Your Majesty, being so excellent in gifts and ornaments of wisdom, and I, a poor woman, so much inferior in all respects of nature unto you, why now do you seem to require my judgment? Must I and will I refer my judgment in this and all other cases to your majesty's wisdom? Not so by St Mary. You are become a doctor, Kate, to instruct us as we may take it, not to be instructed and directed by us. If your majesty take it so, then hath your majesty very much mistaken me. When I have been bold enough to seem to dispute, it was only to try to distract your majesty from the pain of your illnesses and also so that I might have the pleasure of hearing your discourse. Is it even so, sweetheart? And tended your arguments to no worse end? Then perfect friends we now are again, as ever at any time before. I come with a warrant to arrest the Queen. Knave. Arrant knave. Beast and fool, get out! I knew exactly how to manoeuvre within the complicated religious and political world of Henry's court, and my multiple influences as queen, mother, wife and scholar helped shape the political tone of the court, way beyond Henry's reign, into the reign of Edward and Elizabeth. When I agreed to become Henry's wife, I believed that God had sent me to be queen specifically to help England finish its reform. The actions of my opponents in trying to depose me and the eventual religious choices of Elizabeth once she was queen all point to show just how successful I was in my mission. It's easy to understand the power and influence of a king. After all, they make the laws and decide on policy. The influence of a queen is subtler and more hidden from sources, but that doesn't mean it was any less important. Especially with a king like Henry, personal relationships trump everything. <laughs> 